turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 17. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 17. A reading from the Epistle to the Hebrews, beginning in the 17th verse of the 11th chapter. By faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son, of whom he had been told, It is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. He considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone from the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked blessings for the future on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons, or each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions about his burial. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord of all power and might, you are the author and giver of all good things. Graft into our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true faith, virtue, and religion, and nourish us with all goodness, and of thy great mercy keep us in the same. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Bless you. <laughs> or as we used to do at the seminary, bless you in nomine patri et fidei spiritus sancti. It's a joke. It's just a. It's just a joke. <laughs> Latin, actually. But it's all Latin. It's all Latin. Um, <clears throat> We mentioned last week, well, two weeks ago, that Abraham was listed more than Moses, if you consider this entire chapter, which is intriguing for someone who, I believe, wasn't a Levite who wrote the book, Barnabas. (coughs) If he who lived under the Mosaic law wrote more about Abraham than Moses, it's for a statement. And that statement was basically that Moses was the author of all who are faithful. Not necessarily of Israelite descent, but of all who are faithful. He was the father of not just one nation, but of many nations. That theme carries on here in his children. For although Abraham starts us off, he does not dwell with Abraham, but goes to all the patriarchs. And we learn from Abraham, the father of faith, the exemplar by which most of the apostles go to. Paul, in Romans, goes to Abraham. Barnabas, here, goes to Abraham. James goes to Abraham. They all go back to him as a perfect example of how you are justified by faith working in love, not by the works and deeds you have done. And so here, we see Moses not being lifted up as an example and giving the, although he will be, he's not given as a prime example or the starting point. Abraham is. And we talked about how Christ and John the Baptist both mentioned that God is able to raise up sons from stones for Abraham. And so both figuratively, they, we are the children of Abraham by faith, the new Israel, and possibly some of us, depending on our lineage, might literally be the children of Abraham. He became the father of many nations through Ishmael and Isaac, and Ishmael's descendants and Isaac's descendants. He became the Abraham, the exalted, the great father. And here we see his lineage. Here we see his heritage. Here we see his example of faith passed down. And we have three points to bring this out. First, faith instructs our hearts. Second, faith increases our hope. That should, there should be an R there, sorry. And third, faith informs our heritage. 
Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, that's on the back part of the bulletin. Um, so just put an R in between increases and hope on the second point. So faith instructs our hearts. Faith increases our hope. Faith informs our heritage. First, faith instructs our hearts. Look at the example of Abraham given in verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. Then he goes on to say, He who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son, verse 18, of whom it had been told him, Through Isaac, your descendants shall be named to you. Now we've covered this passage in Genesis. Uh, when we went through our Genesis sermon. But it's an amazing passage. By faith, Abraham quells and instructs his heart. Do you remember Lot's wife just a few chapters before in Genesis? She could not instruct her heart even not to look back. And yet, Abraham uses faith to instruct his heart, to instruct his conscience, to do the right even when it costs him his all. Literally, his all. It is his son, it is his heritage, it is the very point of his lineage in the future, and the very hope of his promise. You shall be Abraham, exalted father, and through Isaac shall your descendants be numbered. Go, offer up Isaac, your beloved, your only son, as a sacrifice to me. I am the Lord Almighty. When faith calls us to make the hard choice, we probably never have one harder than Abraham's task. Notice it's tougher than the choice of a martyr. For if you give up your own life, it is different from having to make the decision not only to give up the life of your son, but to do it yourself by your own hand. Some of you uh, may have noticed, I, uh, at least two of you were in my apartment at one point, I had a picture of uh, Brutus, it's called The Sacrifice of Brutus, on my, on my dining room wall. Now it's in my bedroom, in the, in the apartment, but in my apartment it was on the dining room wall. Um, this is kind of the Roman version of Abraham's sacrifice of his son. It was a father, and I won't get into all the details, but it was a father who basically, out of love and devotion and duty, to the Roman state as the Roman consul sentenced his own children to death and had to watch the execution and then it's him in mourning bringing his sons back to his house. For although he did his duty to the state and executed his sons, he then, un unlike the others who were thrown into over um, the Tarpeian Rock and just left to, to be caring for birds, he carried his children back he dressed their wounds, he gave them honorable burial, even though they were traitors to the Roman state. He fulfilled his duty. And so that's, that picture was, um, well, not that picture, but the reproduction. But that picture was made by David. And the point of Jean Jacques David of France, and the point of him making it was to show forth the terrible consequence of the man who fulfills his duty to the uttermost. I like that picture. I like that painting. Although, although I'm not necessarily giving agreement to the action, I like the idea of someone doing their duty even when it hurts. Someone fulfilling their faithfulness to both the state and to the family, or we could say the church and the family, or God and the family. That he, he does his duty, but then he shows his love in burying his sons properly. And the, the picture is of the, the main front end on there. Why do I bring this picture up? That's what Abraham was expecting. We're so used to the end of the story that we don't really expect the sacrifice. We know not God's not going to kill him. We've read it. From four to five to six years old, whenever we heard it in Sunday school, we know that's not going to happen. But put yourself in Abraham's shoes. I expect to go out with my son, to have him be sacrificed, and then to carry his body back to my grieving wife and prepare him for burial. 
because of my duty to my family and my duty to my God. That's the mindset of Abraham when he sets out on his journey. That's the temptation to constantly turn back. It was a journey. They were not camping at the base of Mount Moriah. They had to go there. And he went with others, I think, so that he would have the courage. Remember, there were others along with him until they got to the base of the mountain. And then he tells the servants, wait here for us. And he sends them out with just his son. His only son whom he loved, for his other son had been driven away. And he knows not where he is. And as far as we know, the only time that that other son ever interacts with Abraham again is after he's dead, at his burial. My one son is gone. My other son is being requested of me by the Lord. And so he climbs up the mountain, willing to sacrifice for his duty to God. That is not a natural thing of the heart. That is not something that we would incline our wills toward as a natural good. It's kind of like those people who say, I love exercise, it gives me endorphins, it gives me... Well, you didn't start out that way. That's not something you're inclined to do unless you're an eight-year-old boy. It's something that as we age, we don't really want to do. But eventually we train ourselves to do it. Same with the heart, same with the conscience. It needs to be informed, it needs to be trained toward the good. It's one of the reasons why God constantly says, I set before you this day life and death. And then, he has the second part, choose life. Yeah. By the way, this is what you should do. Why? Because you're inclined to choose death. Choose life. I know you have concupiscence. I know you have original sin. I know you have depraved hearts that seek your own ill. So, let me give you the answer to the test. Choose life. Our hearts have to be informed to do the right. Our consciences have to be trained. God has given us all the natural light of conscience, but we live in a sinful and darkened world. Christ says, if that light within you is dark, how deep is that darkness? He's referring to a conscience that has been stained by sin, a heart that is not informed by faith. If Abraham had not trained his heart to do the right, he would have said, no, I am not going. No, I will not sacrifice my son. No, I will not bring his dead body back to my grieving wife. You are crazy, Lord. That's what we would want to say in our natural state. And yet, faith informs the heart so that faith finds a way. In the recent... Um, movie Jurassic World, I'm not sure if any of you have seen it. It's good. You should go. Um, there's a there's there's a there's there's a line that they that they added that they took out of the movie, which was just kept talking about life finds a way, and it's and it's referring back to the original movie where it says life always finds a way. That could better be translated faith finds a way. Through faith he found a way to do what he needed to do. Through faith, he informed his heart so that he said, even though this doesn't seem right, even though this seems wrong, even though this seems cruel, God must have a better plan because I trust in him rather than in my own heart. The Bible says, lean not with your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. That's a verse directly telling you that you should inform your heart. Train your conscience. Faith helps us to choose the right. Sometimes we wonder how common sense can be such a rare commodity if it's so common. It has to be trained. It's not so common. You have to be informed to choose the right, whether that be the natural right, such as common sense, or whether that be the revealed right found only in the Bible. You have to know the scriptures. You have to use them to move your heart to be in a place where you want to do God's will. Where you want to have a right heart and a right faith before God. 
And so verse 19 goes on to say that even though he was going to offer up him through whom his descendants shall be named, he considered the fact that God was able to raise someone from the dead. Notice that. He considered the fact. When did he do that? When he was struggling with his decision to obey, I believe. How can a loving God tell me that he will give me the descendants as many as the seashores? And how can a loving God also tell me to go and to sacrifice the ones whom he has promised to give me all? These are inconsistent pieces of data. How shall I reconcile them? Well, he tells me he is the God who brought well, he, he'll tell me he's the God who provides all later. But he's already told me, if I'm Abraham, that he is God Almighty. If he's God Almighty, if he's El Shaddai, then he can raise up someone from the dead. Now consider this extraordinary act of faith. No one had ever been raised from the dead. And yet he was willing to put God to the test of his word by himself being put to the test. He was willing to plunge the dagger into his own son's heart to receive his son back again from the dead. Notice what I told you he told the servants. Wait for us. Not wait for me. Wait for us to descend the mountain. And Isaac is not a little boy. He's a young man. He could possibly have fought back to his father. Isaac willingly laid himself down on the altar after he had been informed by his father. Abraham is all of our points in miniature. He passes on this faith as a legacy to his heritage, and he has the hope of the resurrection. Although I'm just using him for the first, for, or just using him really for the first point. His faith is what engenders the faith of everyone who comes after including us. He is the father of the faith. Did that nurture rhyme? Abraham had many sons, and many sons had father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. Well, that may not be genetically true. It is definitely true through the eyes of faith. If we believe, we should strive to be like Abraham, because Abraham sought to be in the will of God. Just as Paul said, follow after me as I follow after Christ, could have easily, Abraham could have easily said, pattern your life after me because I'm trying to pattern it after God. He wasn't perfect. We went through some of his mistakes. But he was faithful. And he went to sacrifice that which was most precious to him because God told him he should. Faith instructs our hearts. Have you ever had two pieces of contradictory evidence from God? Whether that be something that the Bible says it doesn't match up to how you experience it, or two things in the Bible that you don't see how they're reconciled? Faith informs the heart. Faith binds away. Faith tells us how to reconcile these two pieces of data that seem from the human perspective to be beyond knowledge beyond reconciling. Well, I always have this happen, and God says can't plan for good for me. He must be lying. Well, he says if you're faithful, he'll increase, and I haven't found any answer. He said, he said, he said, and I feel, I feel, I feel. An untrained heart is incredibly wicked and deceitful. And no man can know it, says Jeremiah. But here's the gospel. God has promised to give us hearts of flesh and not of stone. This is the new covenant that God made with us, found in the death of his son. We have hearts that have been removed of original, or not removed of original sin, we still have some cubicins, removed of the stain of original sin, and allowed to choose the good. Doesn't mean we always will. Doesn't mean we even mostly will. But we can. The untrained man, the, un, the unnatural, unspiritual man, the natural man has no ability to choose the good freely. It is only by faith that one pleases God, and only by faith that one can ultimately choose the good. Even his best action is as filthy rags, according to Isaiah. 
We have the great gift of being able to have hearts of flesh. Hearts that have been at least partially cleansed and will eventually be fully cleansed. Hearts that are able to be instructed to choose the good. If we are tempted to choose evil, if we are tempted to fall back into sin, if we are tempted to give the devil a foothold in our hearts, use your faith to inform your heart to choose the right. Because faith finds a way through. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. And God will, with the temptation, provide what? A way, a way, of, way of escape. Through faith. Faith informs the heart. Faith helps us to choose the right, even when it seems impossible. Even when we're giving up that which we think we want the most. Even when we're giving up our own children. Now hopefully we aren't giving them up to sacrifice. That's probably not going to happen today. But what if your child says, I want to become a missionary in the Congo and I'll probably never see you, except for one time every five years on furlough? What if your child who is apt to make, I don't know, make it become a doctor, make somebody of himself, become a lawyer, says, I want to choose a ministry and work for part-time in, in this field? What if your child seems to leave the faith? What if it isn't so much going toward God, but going away from God? God, you promised that if you raise them up right, they'll not depart. How do I make these two fit together? How do I make my experience match the promise? Faith. God is able to turn back the heart even of righteous lot. He didn't seem to do a whole lot of righteousness. And yet, was ultimately saved. Faith finds a way. Faith also increases hope. This comes out of faith finding a way. If you know that God who promised is faithful, it makes you more hopeful. Isaac hoped for resurrection. He laid himself down willingly and hoped that God would bring him through. And then Isaac went on to bless both his children. That's interesting. He goes on to say that Isaac, verse 20, invoked the blessing for the future on Jacob and Esau. Why is this an act of faith? Why is this an act of hope? Could he just invoke his blessing on whoever he chose? Not according to him. When Esau says, give me the blessing also, he says, I can't, my son. I've already given it to your brother, Jacob. And we do not see recorded in scripture where he is able to give his blessing, but according to this divinely inspired author, he eventually at some point must have trusted and hoped in God's promises to his children and his descendants and invoked a blessing upon him, despite the fact that in his culture you only have one blessing given to one person. It's given normally to the, the firstborn. Your inheritance. And yet, by faith in God's word, he stepped out and blessed both his sons, Jacob and Esau, and invoked blessings upon their future. Faith informs our hope. It causes us to do things that have never been done before just because we hope that God will have mercy and that God will fulfill his we do things for faith that we would never do in the business world. We do things for faith that we would never do in aspects of our financial future, in aspects of our, our medical history sometimes, in aspects of other things. We do things in faith that we would never do otherwise. Because we don't have that kind of hope, right and trustfully, in the state, in the doctor, in the broker, in the economy. Put not your trust in princes or in the horse to save, but your trust in the Lord your God, the psalmist says. 
Because our faith, because our fontedo, because our trust, our confidence is in God, it increases our hope. If we hope that someone will do something for us, it's always a shaky thing for us. Well, I hope they do. Are they coming back? Well, gee, I hope they are. I'm going to back. Are they going to pay the rent? Well, gee, I hope they are. Are they going to skip town? Well, gee, I hope they don't. Is that the kind of hope we're talking about when we say faith increases hope on God? I don't think so. That hope is a hope that endures. That hope is one that produces faith, and faith produces hope in a continual cycle. I have seen the goodness of God. I trust in Him. I hope in His promises. Oh, I see another promise fulfilled. Now I have more hope because I have more faith. Oh, I have more. It's a self-fulfilling cycle. And so because faith informs the heart to trust, and trust sees the goodness of God, the heart then hopes more upon the Lord and less upon the world or our own strength or outside force to save us. And Isaac, although he had never had evidently heard of two blessings being given when he tells his son, I cannot bless you. The blessing is gone from me. Evidently, again, not recorded in scripture. We don't have we don't have that that evidence. So we have to go from what Hebrews tells us, which is just a glimpse. The Bible gives us just glimpses of things that we long to look into sometimes. Invokes blessings on both on Esau as well. That's a mighty act of faith for someone that considers the blessing basically like an inheritance. The blessing was something that you would give, and you would give one time and for all before you died. And you normally only gave it to the eldest son. Jacob, pretending to be the eldest son, takes the blessing, runs away, eventually finds God, comes back, and then he wrecks up with his brother. And his brother says, give me a blessing too. Evidently, he persists in saying this because at some point, Isaac calls upon God for power to bless Esau as well, and in faith, blesses him. That's what he's talking about when he says, in faith, Isaac blesses both his children. That is a huge step of faith for him. It's something that had never been done before in his lifetime that he had seen, and yet he trusts in God to provide another blessing for his other son. By faith, he acts and gives a blessing in hope of its fulfillment. So faith produces hope, and hope, when fulfilled, produces faith again, which produces more hope. Continual cycle. Faith should increase our hope. It should inform our heart. It should increase our hope. And it should also <clears throat> instruct our heart, increase our hope, and it should finally inform our heritage. That one act of faith, not as great as his father Abraham's, by any means, instilled faith in his descendants, so that his next son, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing over the top of his staff. So notice that it goes one more step removed. For when did he do this? When he was blessing his one son, his two sons, his twelve sons. Faith informs our heritage. Jacob evidently knew that Esau received a blessing. Maybe when they reconciled, he was recounting the fact that, guess what? Dad trusted God so much, they actually gave me a blessing too. What? No, 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 I only get the blessing. I worked hard for that blessing. Yeah. I went and killed someone, I put some skins on, I went in, then I ran away. You can get two blessings? You mean if I would have just trusted God and waited, I could have got a blessing too without the deceit? What? I worked for Laban really hard. Now I'm stuck with Leah and she has a weak eye and uh, I wanted the blessing. And Jacob goes on to not just bless two sons, but twelve sons. And when he gets to his eleventh son, he blesses not only his sons, but his grandsons. In a step of faith, he moves even further from that which everyone knows is logical common sense. Not just you can only give your blessing to your firstborn son. Not just you can only give your blessings to your biological initial sons. 
you can give your blessing to your grandson. Because he considered Joseph as dead. And so he passed on the blessing to his children. Even though he received Joseph back from the dead figuratively by finding him in Egypt, he does not give the blessing directly to Joseph because he counted him dead in his heart. So instead of leaving Joseph bereft, he gives it to his children, both of them. Faith provides for a lineage. Faith informs our heritage. If your parents are faithful, your children, seeing that faith in action, are more likely to carry it forward. It's not always true. It's not a guarantee. One thing about God who says, I am what I am, I am who I am, I am what I will be, is that he is not, as C.S. Lewis says, a tame lion. There are no guarantees with God. But he who promises is faithful. And more often than not, if your children see you in action, see your faith put to work, they will have faith themselves when tough times come. Doesn't mean they won't stumble. Doesn't mean they won't go off for a time. Doesn't mean, like the prodigal son, they may not come to you and say, Gee, Dad, I wish you were dead so I can get some money. Give me my money now. I, I, I want you dead. Let me have some money and I'll go spend it on profligate living. Read Las Vegas and all that on all the seven tales. Doesn't mean that that won't happen. Doesn't mean that you won't get a Jacob or a Lot. Doesn't mean you won't get a prodigal son. It just means that when the going gets tough, they're more likely to remember those acts of faith and act in faith themselves. Lot had final faith because he saw his uncle have faith. The prodigal son said, came to his senses, and said, The worst of my father's servants is treated better than me. I will go and I will tell my father I will be your servant. That's an act of faith to go back into faith and gamut. And just hope that your father will receive you. Jacob, who is a trickster and a wrestler with God, by faith becomes the father of Israel, the nation promised to bring forth the Messiah. These weren't perfect kids. These weren't even necessarily good kids for most of their childhood. And yet, they were instruments in the hands of God because they were in a heritage from faith. And they had seen faith and action in the home. Children are more likely to follow in faith when they see their parents acting in faith. Children are more likely to be faithful when they see faith making a difference in their lives. When in faith, informed consciences say, though this will hurt me in the world, it's what God wants, and I will do my duty. When in faith, People say, I have hope in God, and therefore I will do this, so no man before me has done it. In faith, when they step forward and they say, though the world despises me, and it seems that all things go wrong, yet I have faith in God who has promised. When in faith they say, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord, and they respond with an informed heart, even if God asks for their spouse, even if God asks for their child whether it be in the womb or out of the womb, even if God asks for their job, their house, their livelihood, their home, their country, their very life. If they see their parents acting in faith, it creates a heritage of faith they are more likely to draw on. Whether they choose to draw on it or not, it's there. You want a legacy, a lineage, a faithfulness, God, so that your inheritance of faith will be the blessing of that. That can serve them better than any inheritance, any trust, any amount of money that you can give them. For money will corrupt and fade away. Things of the world Amen. will fall. But our God stands forever. And it will eventually be the ones of faith that cry, Alleluia, salvation and power and glory and honor unto our God, for Babylon has fallen and will drink the blood of the saints. This world 
is not destined for very long. We are called to the new and the better world that they hope for by faith, with informed hearts and hopeful heads and hopefully faithful heritages. Let's pray. We thank you, O Lord, that you have made Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph hopeful in you. Abraham hoped for the return from the dead Isaac hoped that his son would receive a blessing even though his blessing was gone. Jacob hoped that his grandchildren would be blessed even though they were not his children. And Joseph hoped that the Israelites would leave Egypt and that his bones would be buried in the land promised him by God as an heritage forever. Help us who are your heritage and the sons of your handmaidens to be faithful in all things. For truly, you are the God of Israel upon whom we have trusted since our birth. For we are in your hands, and all of the hairs of our head are counted by you. Help us to put our trust in you and direct us all of our days. For we ask it in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.